Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for our Coastal Virginia Diverse Blood Donor Awareness and Education Series. Today, we're gonna to be discussing a new generation of blood donors, how young people can impact their community. Before we get started, we just would like to review a couple housekeeping. Um, first of all, everyone is muted and their um, video is off. Um, our session today is being recorded and in the next uh, couple days or, or in the next week, we will have that video um, up on our website so that you can um, share um, or you can go back and watch again for your reference. Closed captioning is available um, for each participant. You would need to turn that on for your, for your own um, use. There is a chat feature. Please use this feature to um, join the conversation. However, if you have questions, um, please put those in the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen. Also, to improve your bandwidth, um, it's a good idea to close any additional windows and apps. All right, and we also would love to thank our community partners that have helped us with this series, um, Virginia Humanities, Hampton Roads Community Foundation, Dollar Bank, Geico, Hampton University, and the Crestwood High School Alumni Association. And of course, we would love to thank all of our veterans as we celebrate, celebrate Veterans Day tomorrow Thank you so much for your service and for all you have done. We truly appreciate you. All right, and today with us, we have an excellent panel. Um, I know you're gonna enjoy everything that, that um, we have to discuss today. Um, I, before, we get, before we dive into who is with us, I don't believe I introduced myself. Um, my name is Katie Niehoff. Um, I am the executive director of the Coastal Chapter of the Red Cross. Thank you again for joining us. Um, today with us, we have Mario Jenkins. He is Hospitality Service uh, Services Manager with the American Red Cross. He's gonna be sharing his own personal experience. Um, we also have from Hampton University School of Nursing, we have Dr. Ethlyn McQueen Gibson, Lena Dennis, and Kaya Floyd. We're very excited to have them with us as well. Um, we also have Dr. Yvette Miller, who is the executive medical officer from the American Red Cross, and Mel Harris, who is a donor recruitment manager with the American Red Cross. And finally, we are going to have um, one of our youth board members from the Coastal Chapter, uh, Mary Casper will be joining us later to share some of her experience. So right now, I would like to go ahead and turn this over to Mario. Um, Mario, uh, thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to um, hearing uh, about your experience. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me, Katie? Yes, I sure can. Thank you. All right. Um, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Mario Jenkins. Um, I am the hospital services manager for the South Carolina region. Um, here for the American Red Cross. Um, I've been with the organization 21 years now, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and you know my my battle with sickle cell disease. Um, I have sickle cell um, disease, beta thalassemia. Um, it's a condition that affects my hemoglobin. Um, it also um, causes my red blood cells to form a sickle shape or a crescent shape that, uh, you know, that, you know, blocks my blood from going to my vessels and, and causes pain crisis. Um, I was diagnosed with this sickle cell disease um, back when I was three years old. Um, discussion with my mother you had, has told me that, you know, when I was born, you know, I used to cry a lot and, you know, Nobody knew why, you know, they would take me back and forth to the doctor and, um, you know, they would give various diagnoses of everything until I reached the age of three and um, someone, I guess, ran a test and discovered that I had sickle cell. And um, from that point on, um, my life was different. Um, I do incur a lot of 
pain crisis um, as a child. I, I rarely went to school. Um, I had to have a homeschool teacher from the time I was in um, elementary school to the time I graduated. Um, I spent a lot of time in the hospitals um, and and there was really nothing that no one could do for me at the time because there really wasn't much information out there at that time. I got diagnosed back in the 70s and technology and research was nowhere where it is today. Um, so, you know, basically, you know, I, I had to live off of just being medicated, you know, pain medication and and fluids is, is basically what they gave me for the majority of my life. Um, I dealt with that, you know, all three years. I, I was unable to go to um, play on any sports. Um, I tried. Um, it was unsuccessful. Um, I, I would last for, you know, a couple of weeks maybe until a crisis would hit, and then, you know, I, I would have to quit the team. So um, I, I gave up on sports just to, you know, make sure that I protect myself a little more. Um, you know, and that was basically my struggle at the time. Um, I ended up going to college um, where I learned to, you know, take care of my health a little better. Um, I still had the same struggles with um, staying in school and, and getting my work done, but I was able to graduate and everything. Um, and, you know, and you know, it's just a struggle for people with sickle cell to have a normal life um, because of the pain. And, and um, you know, and I'm glad that I'm able to have that. And I think I done almost ran too far past my time. But um, just to go forward now, you know, after I graduated, I ended up working for the American Red Cross. And I work in a department that uh, specifically ships blood to help sickle cell patients. And when I got here, I was um, very proud to be that, you know, in that department that took care of people that, that are affected like me. So um, I'm still here to this day. And um, I thank the Red Cross for that. And, you know, and, I, and I'm glad to be here. Um, I wasn't projected to be here, per the doctors say. Um, they gave me a timeline that was way below my 40s. And um, I'm, I'm glad to say that I'm still here and I'm still alive to tell my story. Um, thank you. Um, I'm gonna give it back to Katie now. And I'm gonna go on mute. Mario, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and, and your experience. And we're so glad that, that you're here and that you're with us and um, that you're with the Red Cross. Um, just an amazing story. And just really uh, just is the, reason why this conversation is so important and, and to make sure that we're getting donors to drives. And, and um, again, we just really appreciate you and thank you for being here with us. No problem. Thank you. Okay. And now um, I would love to introduce um, from Hampton University School of Nursing, um, Dr. Ethelyn McQueen Gibson, who is the Associate Professor and Director of the Gerontology Center of Excellence. Um, we are so grateful to have you with us. Um, and I know that we have two students also who are with us, um, Lena Dennis and Kaya Floyd. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. And um, we are excited to hear um, what you all have been doing and um, your experiences as uh, being nursing students. So thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, first of all, um, we would like to bring you um, greetings from our home by the sea um, in Hampton, Virginia. And um, on behalf of our president, um, Dr. William R. Harvey, and also from our um, Dean um, of the School of Nursing, Dr. Arlene Montgomery. Um, we also bring greetings um, from everyone. Um, so um, I have a couple of um, questions um, for um, our two um, senior nursing students, um, Lena Dennis and um, Kaya Floyd, um, who are here with us. And they are also members of our um, Nursing Honor Society, um, Chi Eta Phi. Um, so I also want to give um, kudos um, also to that honor society. Um, so my first question um, regarding um, sickle cell disease um, is, um, ladies, um, can, you, can you tell me um, why it's important um, to educate 
um, African Americans in the community um, about sickle cell disease. Why is that important? It's important to educate African Americans about sickle cell disease because it's very prominent in our community. We should know what's going on in our community and what can affect us. So that's why I feel like it's important to educate. Kaya? I would have to piggyback off of what Lena said. It's extremely prevalent in the African American community. And I also think it's important because sometimes people can have a disease such as sickle cell and not even know that they have it until a crisis occurs. And I think education is important so that if somebody were to recognize the signs of a crisis, maybe they could help out a family member or a friend or even a coworker. Now, I know that um, number two, both of you young ladies um, have been in the hospital caring for patients. Um, have you ever cared for um, a patient with sickle cell disease or sickle cell crisis? And did it make a difference that you were the person at the bedside taking care of that patient? Um, personally, I have not cared for a patient with sickle cell crisis. I have seen patients during my rotations and clinicals with sickle cell. And sometimes I would walk into the room and, you know, sometimes it's a little different when they see students and nurses that look like them. And so I can only hope that my presence brought some relief as seeing somebody who looked like them that could also be an advocate for them. Um, I have not unfortunately had a client with sickle cell anemia, but I know that we study it in class from time to time. So I make it a mission to pay attention to it. So when it comes up in the clinical setting, I can know what to do. Okay. My next question for the two of you um, is related to just being a blood donor um, and being an African-American. Do you think it's important um, within the African-American community and just in communities that are black and brown to be a blood donor? Um, Kaya. Well, personally, I am a blood donor myself, and um, I do think it's important, especially because sometimes people don't even know what type of blood they have. Like, I'm an O, I'm an o negative, um, I guess, blood type, and I wasn't aware of that until I donated blood for the first time, and I wasn't aware how important O negative blood could be to some people. Um, and I think, especially in sickle cell disease, that blood can do a lot of things and it can help um, in any kind of anemia they may have and any kind of prevention of organ failure of those sorts. So I do think blood donation is very important, especially in the African-American community. I think blood donation is very important. I am also a blood donor. I've donated blood for the first time in August. And I felt like it was important to help somebody else that may need that blood. Like I am a O positive blood donor and I found out that is important too. So I just felt like doing that kindness of just giving a pint of blood could save somebody's life. Okay. So um, this is my final question for the two of you. Um, as you are now speaking out to um, those on the screen um, who are in your generation, what is important to you um, as a message to them um, as future blood donors or as continuing to be blood donors? What would you like to say to them? And I'll start with Lena. I would just want them to know that your donation isn't a waste. It isn't going by the wayside. Like it's always important. You make a difference in somebody's life. It's always important to be a blood donor. So to keep on being a blood donor, you're saving people's lives constantly and to start being a blood donor because it's a good experience and you get to learn a lot while sitting in that chair. Okay. Kaya? Um, once again, picking up, piggybacking off of Lena's great answer, um, to continue being a blood donor is extremely important because like she said, so many people can be positively affected by the blood you give. And for those who haven't blood, who haven't donated blood before and are maybe thinking about starting it, sometimes there's a lot of stigma of fear around blood donor. Like, oh, I don't know how much blood they're gonna take. Oh my gosh, like, how am I gonna feel? Most blood donation centers are very comfortable, very well equipped to handle if you possibly feel faint or anything like that. And even then the likelihood of that is quite low. 
Um, so just to maybe dispel any fear that people may have if they haven't donated blood before, because it is a very important thing to do. Well, thank you, ladies. Um, and so from Hampton University School of Nursing and our home by the sea, um, you can see that here at the School of Nursing, we are preparing great um, healthcare providers. And with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Yvette Miller. And thank you all for letting us participate. Dr. Miller. Thank you. thank you so much, Dr. Gibson and Lena and Kaya, um, for the words that you shared and the information that you shared. And oh, I hold on a second. My phone's ringing. I'm on call today. That's what happens. Let me just grab that. <laughs> Well, I would, I would love to thank um, the students and Dr. Gibson for all the information that they shared. And um, I just think it's it's so important, especially to hear from um, blood donors that, that are um, currently in, in college and, and out there donating. It's just excellent. And we so appreciate um, all that you shared and, and the information that, that you gave. All right, and we are waiting. Uh, Dr. Yes, Miller will I'm be back. joining I us. Back. So, there she is. Oh my goodness, I'm. I'm that not, is you know. no problem. We understand. <laughs> we are glad to have you with us. Oh my goodness. Okay, so thank you so much, um, Dr. Gibson and Kaya and Lena, and because you know your words were so important and. Um, again, I'm always so proud, incredibly proud to say that I started out my career in medicine as a registered nurse, and um, it had it prepared me well to be a physician. And um, some of the things that you learn as a nurse, uh, you don't get that experience as a physician. And so um, my approach of compassion and understanding and um, and knowing how to have a positive impact on people's lives other than you know writing prescriptions and barking out orders. I, uh, I got all of that from nursing. So what I wanna share is again, just continue the conversation that um, Dr. Gibson and um, Kaya and Lena started to just focus on just, again, it's three simple slides, but these three slides are extremely critical in helping people understand why it's important for African-Americans to donate blood. In this country, the majority of individuals with sickle cell disease are African-American or of African descent. About 100,000 people in this country have um, sickle cell disease. The second largest population of individuals with sickle cell disease are Latino. And because um, patients that have sickle cell disease, um, most of them being African-American, there are some unique antigens um, on the bl red blood cells of African-Americans that must be closely matched between the donor and the recipient. And we have the highest percentage of those antigens in people that are African-American or of African descent. And so that's what that direct connection is between African-American blood donors and meeting the transfusion needs of patients with sickle cell disease. So here we're looking at red blood cell and RH antigens. As you know, um, our red blood cell type is, um, as Lena mentioned, it, it's O, A, B, R, A, B, and then there's a, a plus and a minus, and that's the RH factor. So blood cells are A positive, A negative, and so on. And so these are um, a configuration of some of the am antigens that are more common in African Americans. So the very first, um, the first bullet at um, 73% in African Americans, and this um, this RH type is known as C negative. So 73% of African Americans are C negative, and those of European descent, only 32% are C negative. Um, this E negative antigen, it's a little higher in African Americans, but it's fairly high as well in um, those of European descent. And then um, K negative, KEL is a red blood cell antigen, and about 98% of African Americans are KEL negative, and 91% of those of European extraction um, are KEL negative. And so, what's important about these um, three antigens is that when a hospital orders a unit of blood for a patient with sickle cell disease, the primary, the most common request is that the donor 
B, C negative, E negative, and Kel negative. In this country, 80%, and in some areas of the country, over 80% of the donor pool is Caucasian or, or of European descent. So that's why we're having this conversation because we constantly struggle to meet the transfusion needs of patients with sickle cell disease with blood donated by African-Americans. And so when the hospital requests those units in many, most cases, in many cases, they are requesting more than a single unit of blood as, as uh, Mario mentioned. Um, and the amount of blood that a person needs for transfusion is dependent on their body size. So a small baby may only need you know, a half a unit of blood, but a large adult may need 10 or more units in a single transfusion episode, depending on the type of transfusion protocol that individual is on. So when we're looking for this configuration, C negative, E negative, and Kel negative, although we can certainly find it in those that are of European um, descent, it's much easier to find those units and identify those units American-American of African descent. Now, let's get to the critical piece. This antigen, this is another red blood cell antigen, and this is known as, Duff, known as Duffy A negative, B negative. As you can see, basically zero or a very rare percent, a very small percentage of individuals of European descent are Duffy A negative, B negative. So if we were looking for a unit of blood that was Duffy A negative, B negative, and we could find one that was that, we, that was C negative, E negative, and Kale negative, we would be struggling to find a single compatible unit or a few compatible units from our primarily Caucasian donor pool. This is another red blood cell antigen, um, JKB negative, and um, at 52% in African-Americans and at 26% in those of European extraction. Again, while we could certainly find some units from those that are European, um, we of European descent, we would still struggle to find compatible units. So this slide is, I always show this slide, even if I only have like five minutes to show slides, I always show this one because it really brings it into clear view why it's important to have African-American blood donors to meet the transfusion needs of patients with sickle cell disease. And these are just a few of some of the common antigens that we have to match. There are over 600 red blood cell antigens and RH antigens that have we have the potential to have to match between a recipient of blood and the donor of blood. So this gets more complicated because we have hundreds of antigens on our red blood cells. Next slide, please. Or am I so this is another really important slide. So this was actually a patient that we were looking for blood for. So this patient's blood type was O positive, C negative, E negative, Kale negative, which I already talked about, and JKB negative. So if we if we had um, if we screened, and screened by means matching, taking a sample and matching a sample of blood from the recipient and matching a, a sample of the blood from the donor, matching them together to see, or mixing them together to see if they match, that's called a screen. So if we screen 250 units of blood from our primarily Caucasian donor pool, we would find a single compatible unit. Next slide, please. Now for this same recipient, if we screen 250 units of blood donated by African-American donors, we would find at least 28 compatible units. So again, these three slides make it crystal clear why we need African-Americans to donate blood to meet the transfusion needs of patients with sickle cell disease because of all of the antigen matching that we have to do and the high percentage of some of these antigens in the African-American population compared to the primarily Caucasian donor pool that we have. And then the last thing I'd like to leave you with, I am so Please, that Lena mentioned that she her blood type was O negative. So even if we weren't in this conversation and in this space about health equity and health disparities and dealing with health disparities and ensuring that we have blood on the shelves donated by African Americans that meet the transfusion needs of patients with sickle cell disease, it's also critical for people that are African American and Latino to donate blood because these two populations have the highest percentage of O blood 
in the population of, of individuals with O blood type in the population. So it's critically important for us to have a diverse donor pool, just like it is incredible for us to have an inverse donor pool to meet specifically the transfusion needs of patients with sickle cell disease. So um, that's the end of my short presentation. And please, I um, do encourage you to think about questions to ask. Um, I certainly have some questions that will pose and we might even have an opportunity to have a poll, I'm not sure yet. But, um, but thank you so much for your attention and please think about questions to ask. And so now I will introduce you to Mel Harris, who's one of our recruitment managers who will talk about how do we go about recruiting individuals to donate blood. So thank you so much and turn it over to you, Mel. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mel Harris, and I am a sickle cell account manager in Metro Atlanta. I've been with the American Red Cross for a total of seven years, proudly working with the donor recruitment department for the past three years. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this forum discussion about the impact young people can make in community health care. Today, I'll be discussing the American Red Cross recruitment strategies for young and diverse donors, which happens to be my primary target audience in Metro Atlanta. Recruitment of donors is a very important and a necessary step to ensure our blood drives are successful. Since COVID, we've had to step up our recruitment strategies and tactics so that communications align with donor preferences, especially since we've seen a large volume of decline participation from African-American donors. So increasing blood donations from individuals who are Black is a very, very high priority. We have several tactics in place that we follow, but recruitment also involves thinking outside the box. The first step of recruitment begins with donor education. It's extremely important that young diverse donors understand the background and importance of why their blood donations are needed to help sickle cell patients. Virtual forums such as this one or in-person meetings give us the opportunity to connect with young donors to discuss the realization of what we're facing, which is we simply don't have enough compatible blood on the shelves to help sickle cell patients in need. So education is the most important recruitment strategy. If you need marketing materials to pass out to the public in your area, we do have a large virtual library of material available. Um, account managers or sickle cell account managers in your area will be more than happy to provide you with those materials needed to hand out to potential donors. The largest barrier, um, the largest barrier we have with recruitment right now is um, also safety concerns around COVID-19. Occasionally, you may hear young donors discuss their fear of needles or concerns about eligibility status, but the biggest concern is their safety. So educating donors about our education, I'm sorry, our safety um, protocols and eligibility guidelines is another recruitment ta tactic we have in place at the American Red Cross. The COVID-19 safety precautions and eligibility requirements can be found by visiting redcrossblood.org. Several eligibility topics are listed and the information provided beneath those topics can help answer tons of donor eligibility questions. However, if donors cannot find the answer to their question, we encourage them to contact our eligibility specialists at 1-800-RED-CROSS. Another great recruitment tactic are incentives and health-related screenings. With young donors, it's important to highlight the many physical as part of the health history process, which includes pulse check, hemoglobin levels check, and, and blood pressure reading. In addition to that, each blood donation undergoes standard testing, which includes infectious disease screening. Sickle cell trait screening is also being offered for a limited time to donors who self-report as African-American during their health history process. This additional screening will help us identify compatible blood types more quickly to help sickle cell patients and provide our Black donors an additional health insight during a time when health information has never been more important. So what tactics do we put in place to convince donors to show up? Because that's the key, we want them to show up. 
One of my favorite tactics is recruiting, is recruiting a family of donors. Diverse donors truly value family as this is the most important factor in their lives. They prefer to spend time with family. So encouraging donors to donate with a group of family member or friends will help increase donor participation. We call this support system blood buddies and donors that may have a fear of donating seems more calm when they're surrounded by familiar faces. And again, the extra plus is that we have the support of other family members and friends who is also there to donate blood. Convenience is also a very important factor when recruiting donors. According to our 2020 research study, more than half of current donors surveyed stated they will be more likely to consider donating when the blood drive is at a place they frequent most, which includes you know, their workplace, place of worship or school. In essence, we're bringing the donation to them. So this will also help increase you know, blood drive success. Additional recruitment tips includes um, asking donors face-to-face, -face, host recruitment sign-up tables, ask local media to promote, partner with surrounding organizations, offer special incentives for first-time donors, and an internal testimonial, which creates a more personable touch to convince young, young and diverse donors to roll up their sleeves. I've even had um, fun creating theme blood drives like around Black History Month, Sickle Cell Awareness Month, Valentine's Day, um, Halloween, which is one of my favorite as I've been called the vampire on many occasions. So I tend to tie vampire and costume fun into blood drives around Halloween. And lastly, I would also encourage you to check with the account managers in your area about um, current donor incentives. If you have a sickle cell account manager in your area, this is even better as currently all SAMs are allowed to flag sickle cell focused blood drives with a pretty amazing incentive. Um, I think Alexis, uh, Alex Ennis is the sickle cell account manager over Coastal Virginia. I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. Um, but from now until June 30th, 2022, blood drives that have the corporate diversity African-American affiliation automatically qualifies for the sickle cell promotion. This promotion gives each presenting donor with a $20 Amazon e-gift card. In addition to that, if there are any additional active promotions, they are stacked with the sickle cell promotion for a double incentive. So for example, we currently have the $10 Amazon e-gift card promotion nationwide. So donors that give blood at national affiliated accounts with diversity of African-American will receive a total of $30 in Amazon e-gift cards from now until November 23rd. And that comes over in the form of two gift cards um, in the amount of $10 and $20. This promotion alone has increased donor participation at my high schools and colleges in Metro Atlanta. Students leave with a clear understanding of sickle cell and they're more eager to help promote future drives on site to ensure success. Again, don't be afraid to think outside the box. The goal is to reach your audience on their level and don't be afraid to lead the discussion with this statement. I always tell donors, the blood you give today could be the blood that saves your life tomorrow. This is a very powerful statement that tends to, to, to stop people in their tracks to listen. So thank you again for allowing me to speak about the American Red Cross recruitment strategies for young and diverse donors. I'll turn it back over to Katie and Mary. Mel, that was excellent. I, I wrote down um, one of the things that you said, education is the most important marketing strategy. I absolutely love that. And um, that just, that really resonated with me. So thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much for, for all that you do. Um, up on the, the screen right now, you can see some upcoming um, blood drives. Uh, we have several in uh, November and December. Um, we hope that um, if you're uh, participating today that you can go to Red Cross, redcrossblood.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS and register to donate at any of those drives. If you're not able to donate, um, we hope that you would uh, participate by volunteering and most importantly, by spreading the information and sharing with others that we do have these blood drives going on. 
Um, right now, I'm going to ask uh, one of our youth board members from the coastal region, Mary Casper. She's coming to us from high school, so we um, appreciate you taking time out of your day, Mary, to um, chat with us for a couple minutes. Um, before uh, I, I ask Mary some questions, I just want to um, give some background. Um, Mary is a um, student in an um, academy here in Virginia Beach. Um, she is uh, participating um, as a youth board member and has been an absolute wonderful asset to, to, our, um, to our group and to our board. Mary and the two other youth um, board members are currently in the process of planning their first blood drive. So Mary, are you able to come back on screen? There she is. Hey, Mary, how are you today? I'm doing good, how are you? Just one second. I have to go close the door. I'm in a like a little AD. No, no problem. We we understand that sometimes those things happen. Um, so what what uh, Mary and her um, two other uh, board members that that um, are our youth board members here, um, they are working right now, as I said, to plan their first um, blood drive. Um, and so what I wanted to talk to Mary about today, um, Mary, first, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Good. Thanks yeah, so um, much. Let's... Thanks so much for for joining us. No problem. Absolutely. Yeah. It's. Um, I was very excited when um, I learned of this opportunity to kind of come and speak to you guys today. I always love a good panel. Um, <laughs> uh, just getting getting the opportunity to come and speak to people. You know, I talk all day long. So. I, I know, I know you're, that, you're a, a very, a very busy girl there at the academy and um, I know you, you wear a lot of hats in your high school, so we do appreciate it. Um, currently, I know that you're in the process of planning your first blood drive, which is going to take place in nine days. So what I was wondering is if you could share with us, because what we're hoping ultimately is that we get people to blood drives um, to donate blood to help with our sickle cell initiative. But also another side of that is getting into communities and places that we haven't typically been able to, to really spread the education and spread awareness and ultimately get more blood drive. So as someone who is currently planning a blood drive, could you give us a little insight on, on how it's going? How are you guys recruiting donors and have you come up against any challenges? It's well, so far it's going good. Um, me and my other two partners, Sydney and Talisa, we have been working really hard um, to kind of really trying to just get off the marketing pieces off the ground. So like making the flyers and um, making sure the location is secured. That was a little bit of a challenge at first. Um, you know, what's going to be the gym, the auditorium, so stuff like that. Um, and then when it comes to kind of recruiting kids, it's always difficult to, especially, you know, getting to freshmen and sophomores, just because their minds are in like different places. <laughs> um, just trying to reach out to them and get their attention and be like, hey, we got something going on. Um, so that's always been sort of a challenge in itself. And then I would have to say, well, we have to offer a lot of incentives um, in order to kind of get kids to even want to do it. Um, so at the academy, I'm in, in the Entrepreneurship and Business Academy at Kempsville High School. Um, for the academy, you have to get a certain number of volunteer hours um, requirement. And so you have to kind of include a volunteer hour requirement just to even get some kids interested. Now, some kids um, have come up to me and just shown genuine interest to doing a blood drive because the Red Cross has done blood drives at other high schools in our city, um, but just not as much in Kemsel. So they have been interested in it, but a lot of them, it's, you know, it's they're trying to ask for those incentives and, you know, just trying to encourage them to want to do it, you know, not just for the incentives, which I'm also SCA president at my high school. So sometimes to get kids to go to certain events and do spirit weeks, you have to offer them incentives. Um, and so that's just one of the biggest challenges, you know, especially for these 15 year olds, um, just trying to get them to stay well, interested. They've got to be 16 be to donate. So <laughs> make, sure, 16 make, sure, to donate. Yeah, yeah. make sure we're not recruiting them too young. Um, but okay. Absolutely. So Mary, yes, I, I apologize. I, I know I'm just, it, that's okay. Um, Mary, so let me ask you, what have you guys been doing? Is it, are you, getting on the news? Are you creating TikTok videos? Um, are you, you know, are you, is, is it better when it's a face-to-face -face conversation? Um, I think it's for an event like this, at least I think it's better to do more like a face-to-face -face kind of recruitment. Um, 
we have made an announcement slide. So at my high school, I do the morning announcements. So I kind of, you know, go in the big microphone and, you know, do the morning announcements every other day. So we made an announcement slide so I can actually announce it to the whole school that we're having this blood drive and we have the sign up genius ready to go. Um, and we're, you know, we're making QR codes and kind of telling kids about it. And we even got my academy coordinator to post it on our Schoology group. Um, so that's a lot of the recruitment right there. And then also, like I said, kind of us just going up to people and letting them know about it and, um, us, you know, texting people and sending them the sign up genius, sending them the links. Um, it's just, in my, in my experience, that always works the best. It's just face to face kind of, especially for a serious event, like a blood donation, um, just kind of going up to people and, and knowing that you appreciate their efforts that you appreciate them coming out to donate will inspire them and also kind of motivate them to go to others and talk to them. And they might repeat everything that you said to, to them, but it'll work. And so I think that kind of chain reaction um, will be very helpful. And of course, you know, we have about nine days out, so we're still trying to recruit people. Um, our goal is 50 for this blood drive. Um, so, you know, the school spirit that Kemp School has, and this is a student run event, I think that we could possibly hit this goal, uh, especially with a lot of, uh, even teachers have come up to me and expressed interest. Um, so that's always, you know, that's always a really good sign that it's not even just the students that are interested. It's the staff. It's, you know, it's the faculty and staff at our school as well and their family members and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Well, that that's excellent. And just just for um, clarity for for the other folks that are that are on the call, um, Schoology is what the kids use as um, their learning management system. So that's kind of their platform for where they share information. And I know um, Bill Brent had asked if uh, we are using um, the app to sign up. I think he was asking for the, the high school students. The high school students are not using the app. It's a closed drive. So they created themselves the sign up genius. And so the students are actually going in and signing up there. So um, Mary, we are again are so thankful for all the work that you're doing. Um, we do know that when we're able to get kids, um, you know, young adults, uh, high school, college students involved in the Red Cross, we, um, you know, we hook you for life. So, so we're hoping that um, by spreading our mission there at your high school, and I know the you and the um, other two youth board members have plans of. Um, you know, moving outside of your school and possibly reaching into some of the elementary schools and, and surrounding schools in your area. So we just appreciate you carrying the mission. And we like to say when you've got to, you know, stand, stand with someone and kind of give them that, you know, spiel about how, why they should donate, that's your elevator pitch. So we're, we're glad that you're getting some, some practice with that. And um, I know that I will be at your blood drive um, donating. So we, um, again, appreciate all the work that you're doing. And um, I know you probably got to get back to class. So um, again, thank you so much. And um, we are now going to move to some questions. Um, and if we have any questions in our question box. Oh, there, Bill. Awesome. All right. Do we have any other questions right now? I know I had um, one question, uh, Dr. Miller. Um, I'm not sure if, if you would mind explaining what does happen if a recipient um, gets a blood donation that is not a direct match? Well, when a, um, a recipient gets a unit of blood that's not you know, as closely matched as it could be, there's um, several things could happen. Um, one of the most serious things is that when blood is incompatible, the body, it um, stimulates the body's immune response, which basically rejects those um, red blood cells that are not compatible. And so the individual can develop what is called an, an, an antibody or alloantibody. And so that antibody um, attacks those um, red blood cells that immediately, it can be, you can, you can have an immediate um, hematologic response, or you can have what is called a delayed hematologic response. So it just depends on that person's, it depends on the type of red blood cell incompatibility, but there can be an immediate response where the, the antibodies, some of which are preformed, can attack those red blood cells immediately and cause what is called a hematologic um, basically a hematologic storm where all of those red blood cells that just got transfused into that person get hemolyzed or broken down. And that is uh, a medical emergency because it um, 
free hemoglobin, which is inside the red blood cells. It's not supposed to be flowing freely inside the body. That's why it's encapsulated in red blood cells. And so when the red blood cell breaks down, it releases that free hemoglobin, which is um, very, um, I guess is devastating to the kidneys. So um, that free hemoglobin just is, it, 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 can, it can lodge in the brain, just all kinds of things can happen, yeah. but it can cause the body to go into a crisis and the person can stop breathing. So it can really cause um, the body to have um, a co what's called a coagulation storm where all those red blood cells are, are, um, are fragmented and broken down. And then if the antigen is one that is not as uh, stimulating as some of the red blood cells like A, B, and O, when we have, if there's some ABO incompatibility, which it usually is not, um, but it definitely can happen, um, that's when you get the, the full blown um, uh, situation where those red blood cells are broken down immediately in a hematologic um, crisis. And then there are some antigens that are not as um, stimulating to the immune system. And that response to breaking down the red blood cells can happen a few days or even a week later. And that's called a delayed hematologic response. The red blood cells also get broken down, but they get broken down at a much slower rate. And how this manifests itself is a few days later or a week later, the person's skin may, and eyes may start to turn yellow. So that free hemoglobin that I was telling you about that gets into the bloodstream, then as it is slowly broken down in the person's body over those ensuing days to weeks, it can get into the, 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 the sclera, you know, the white part of the eye and the person's skin may also turn yellow. And that may be the very first indication that this patient is having a, what is called a delayed hematologic response. So those are some of the most serious things that can occur when the blood is not closely um, compatible. And so every time a person, a patient develops an antibody, that means on this next blood transfusion, whatever that antigen is that caused that reaction, that subsequently needed unit of blood has to be negative for that antigen so that that transfusion reaction doesn't occur again. So that's what complicates right. um, blood transfusion for patients with sickle cell disease. So that's why it's incredibly important to get it right the first time. Right. Wow. Well, thank you. And, and I, I asked that just because I know I have heard that if they, if they don't get a person in crisis, doesn't get an exact match, it can lead to um, further complications. And so I, I really appreciate you um, answering that. Um, that, that is more the reason why we have to have more blood drives and, and get more people, um, more people involved. Thank you. All right. Um, so one other uh, question that, that I would like to, to ask um, maybe to, to our students, um, if they're still uh, available. Um, I know that we've talked about that some people hesitate uh, to donate. Um, so what are some of the reasons uh, that someone might not, that they might be nervous to donate? And what are some ways that we can overcome that? Um, a few people that I know are, like you said, very afraid of needles. So um, one thing that I kind of say to kind of push you do, I say, oh, the length of the needle isn't really what matters. Like, it's okay, it doesn't hurt, you're sitting there. Usually the person that is taking your blood really distracts you, because I know when I gave blood, I was very, 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 very nervous. And the guy that um, took my blood, he was really just talking with me and it was very relaxing. Like he very, he kept me really distracted because I was terrified that I was gonna pass out. So by the time the time was up, I was like, wow, that was quick. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's pretty positive experience, like I don't think, Anyway, you should really be afraid of it, but I can understand why. Sure, sure. And I, I think what, what you said, Lena, was so um, our, our um, teams that go in to run the drives, they really are very uh, conscientious about that and try to make it um, very um, light and, and try to put um, donors at ease. Um, I know my husband and I, we always try to be extra hydrated so that it, it goes a lot, a lot faster. Um, so, you know, just, just so that that's one thing that, that we always try to do to, to help us feel a little bit better about it. 
So I did want to add, um, and, and a, a couple of questions came in, so we can certainly get to those. Um, but to this conversation about the donating blood and that people, you know, do commonly communicate that they're afraid of needles, but, you know, how, how I explain the importance of just this momentary little discomfort, compare this momentary discomfort to the pain that patients with sickle cell disease have. So this momentary discomfort and donating this unit of blood can alleviate the pain and suffering for a patient with sickle cell disease. So please take this opportunity to help and endure, again, just this small amount of pain to help improve someone's life and save someone's life. So I like to use that. I, that's that's a, a great, great point. So a question came up in the chat, what can prevent you from donating blood? So some of the things that can prevent a person, well, first, let me just talk about how we determine eligibility. So I am myself, and there's one other medical director, her name is Dr. Grimma, and we are the executive medical officers over what is called the Red Cross Donor and Client Support Center. And so we support the staff that answer questions about eligibility. So we have policies and procedures, written policies and procedures that staff can refer to, um, to answer questions about eligibility. So when those questions about eligibility cannot be, um, those answers cannot be found in the materials that we provide for them, but then they call myself and Dr. Grimma and that's what that phone call was <laughs> when, um, when you heard my phone ring. Um, so some of the things that can prevent a person from donating, if your blood pressure is extremely high. So we have a, a, a high cutoff for blood pressure and it's really high. And most people, if your blood pressure is this high, you probably are not feeling well enough to donate. So the cutoff is 180 over hundred. Most people, if your blood pressure is that high, you know, in the hospital, we consider that a medical, a medical emergency. So if your blood pressure that high, is that high, we certainly don't allow you to donate. And we definitely encourage you to take swift action um, to see a healthcare provider to take care of that because that is really extremely, extremely high. You know, some of the other things that can prevent a person from donating, if you have, um, if I've had cancer and you're within that first year. So if you have had cancer, it has to be 12 months since your last treatment. So if your last treatment is December the 1st of 2021, and you remain cancer free and no other treatment from December the 1st to December the 1st of 2022, then you're eligible on December the 1st of 2022. So you have to be cancer free um, and treatment free for 12 months. So that can prevent a person from donating. So th those are some of the most common questions. And, um, and if you're taking, there are some conditions that it's approved for. Again, this is in our procedure with someone that's taking antibiotics. But in general, if you are taking antibiotics, you are not eligible to donate until you complete those antibiotics. Um, those are some of the more common um, things that people get deferred for. Okay, uh, Dr. Miller, we have one more question um, from Josh. Uh, it says, does the blood that is donated stay local or is it distributed to where it is needed? The blood is distributed to where it's needed. So the Red Cross, who is the single largest blood supplier in this country, we have an extensive nationwide network where we can ship blood to wherever it's needed. So that um, it's important while in general, blood that's collected in general stays local, but if it's needed, nationally that blood can be shipped nationally because our inventory system is up to date is up to date moment by moment because when a unit of blood is processed and the infectious disease testing is acceptable then that unit is scanned into inventory so anyone in the country who is looking for that unit of blood and some of those units of blood are already phenotyped um, if someone is looking for that unit of blood they can just look into the inventory for it for it and if the phenotype matches a donor, I mean, a recipient, then that unit of blood can be requested and it can be shipped anywhere in the country. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, I don't, I think that concludes our, our questions.
Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? We had one more question pop in right at the last um, minute, if, if we don't mind um, addressing it. Um, let me see. Let me pull it up. It says uh, some people think that they can't give blood if they have the sickle cell trait. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, Melanie, for, for asking that question. Yes, individuals who are sickle cell trait positive are eligible to donate blood. And another thing that I wanted to mention, again, I was so thankful for um, Lena and Kaya because they mentioned the importance of knowing your sickle cell trait status. And that for many people, they don't know that they have um, sickle cell, um, that they are positive for sickle cell trait until they have a child, they partner with someone who has sickle cell trait who may or may not know their status as well. And then they have a child that has sickle cell trait or a child that has sickle cell disease. So that's why it is incredibly important to know your sickle cell trait status. And the reason why we are in the Red Cross, we are focusing on um, uh, screening for sickle cell trait status in those individuals that self-identify as African-American is because in this country, over 90% of those individuals that have sickle cell disease are African-American of African descent. So that's the population that we are most um, concerned about making sure, ensuring that we have um, adequate amounts of blood on the shelves. Again, this is a health despair meeting, uh, you know, trying to, to meet uh, the needs of a population who um, are, you know, who generally have been affected by health disparities and health inequities. And so that's one of our primary responsibilities um, from the American Red Cross. Thank you so much. And thank you for that great question. All right, and that concludes our questions and answers. All right, so I would love, I would like to take a minute just to thank all of our panelists. Um, Mario, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Gibson, Lena, and Kaya, thank you so much. Dr. Miller, thank you for being with us. Um, Mel and Mary, we appreciate your time. Um, I would also like to thank the team that worked behind the scenes on this. So um, all of you that, that have, we've been meeting and getting this organized, um, I just would like to take a moment to thank you guys for um, all the hard work. Um, please uh, know that we will be sending out um, a survey to uh, get your feedback. We wanna make sure that um, we are providing information um, in a way that um, meets the needs of um, our folks that are participating. Also, please remember that we will um, post the video. Um, so if you would like to share it with um, anyone else or let them know um, that it's available, it will be on our uh, local Red Cross website within the next few weeks. We have another session coming up in February. So please look for that information and join us again. You can always get involved with the Red Cross by volunteering, donating, um, or by volunteering to host a blood drive. You can go to redcross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Please follow us on all social media. We always share lots of good information and our app is amazing. So please uh, download our app so that you can get updated information, especially if you are a blood donor. It is really exciting to watch your blood journey so you can see where your blood um, is going and how it is impacting someone else. All right, so again, we just wanna say thank you all so much for um, joining us. Um, thank you to all of our veterans. We hope that um, tomorrow is a great day for everyone, especially for you. And again, we are going to put up our blood drive um, that are coming up in the next uh, month, or mo two months. Uh, please um, spread the word and uh, help encourage us, encourage other people to attend those blood drives. If you have a community partner that you work with that you think would like to host a blood drive, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to arrange that. Thank you guys all so much, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week.